We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and welcome to part five of our F1 Team Genealogy Series, aka the part that we have been waiting for and the whole reason why we're doing this entire series is for these two teams i would argue it's one of the reasons why we're doing this podcast (laughs) i mean yeah and we've always talked about wanting to do a force india episode or cover it somehow and i think this is a perfect way to kind of like weave it in um but we're finally to the end we're covering our last two teams and i'm like kind of sad about it this has been really fun but it's for been me, you've done all the research. I know it's been a lot yeah. of work for you, but it's also been fun to like discuss and and just go down memory lane, if you will. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely been a ton of fun. My brain is about to melt out of my ears from all of the research that I've had to do to compile all of these rundowns. Like if we're looking at the the document that we've been doing all the rundowns on is 19 pages long. And I think this episode itself is one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six and a half pages. With so, that said, we have saved the best for last. <laughs> we really have though. And like... When when we like when we came up with the idea that we were going to do this, we knew that these two teams were going to be the last ones because they just a were going to take us the longest, but b have so much absurdity and like maybe not the richest history in the in the in the case of like wins and victories on track, but they have a lot of stuff that happened. Yes. A lot. They have six pages of things that have happened. (laughs) And this is like the bare bones of like the big things that we need to know about that I probably also did miss some other big things that happened in like significant races and things like that. But like there's so much that that happened that I've been able to jam into whatever we're going to do with this episode, however long this episode is going to be. I'm and- literally just going to say, like, you know, buckle up because this one's going to be one, a ride, and two, will be very long. Yes. I mean, the, the last Catherine episode. Has estimated an hour and a half, which means we're probably going to go over two hours. I mean, I hope we don't go like over two hours. <laughs> I don't want to go over two hours because I'm the one who has to edit this as well. So let's let's hope okay. that's not going to happen. But fingers crossed, I can push us along. But with that said, let's get started. Before we jump into our last two teams, I just want to recap. This is our F101 F1 Team Genealogy Series. This is part five of five. We do have four other parts that we covered. Eight teams in. Our last two teams are Alpine and Aston Martin. Hopefully you guys have figured out the theme by now, Um, but we're doing this just to kind of really explore the teams of today that are currently on the grid and where they started, when they started, how they became who they are. So with that being said, let's jump into Alpine, which started out as Coleman Motorsport. So back in the 80s, well, I guess they were a team early 80s, but they were founded. This is the thing that throws me off with all of these teams. They're like founded at a certain time, but they're not actually a team until another time. Obviously the build up, whatever. Um, but they were founded in the seventies and then they became Coleman Motorsport and they were on the grid in the early eighties. So their first true season was 1981. Yeah. Which true. I mean, yes, true season technically, but they only, entered races four through 15 but only each <laughs> participated in one race um one driver which is the fin- most alpine thing ever <laughs> right right and they weren't even alpine yet we i mean Renault's not even in the picture at this point but they yeah there was one p10 finish and this was back when p10 didn't even count for points and the other driver dnf'd uh, they're one of the teams where you know usually you your your number of like races entered and races participated in is is pretty close. This one, they entered 70 races, but only actually competed in 57. God, yeah. They were doomed from the start. 
<laughs> yeah, they they only had um, two classified finishes. The other other years they didn't classify at all. 1983 they finished P9, and 18, uh, 1984 they finished P7. They had five different drivers in '84, including Ayrton Senna, who had his first F1 season. He drove 15 of the 16 races and had three podiums: a P2 in Monaco, which was the team's best finish, and then two P3s in Silverstone and Portugal. Oh boy, that well one is insane that like the, it seems like this team was a hot mess and Senna was so good that he could still podium. <laughs> yeah, and he he not only could he podium, but he was also part of one of the most dramatic Monaco Grands Prix ever, um, which technically you know based on how you look at it, he should have won that race. Uh, this was in '84 where it was raining really badly and as you know in monaco the track is very unique in that there's a tunnel that you drive through that's part of the track and if there's wet weather then you're gonna go from a very wet track to a very dry track pretty immediately and that's like hell on the tires and this is even before we have the tire situation that we have now but controversially they stopped the um the race on lap 32 where senna was ahead of alan prost who had won the race but the rules listed that the position had to be for drivers who competed the full lap and since not everyone raced lap 32 they counted back to the positions on lap 31 and that gave prost the the win of the race over senna very controversial yeah maybe Maybe up there with the uh, 2021. Well, I think 2021 was controversial for other reasons. That no, there. What what no, was? No, I'm just saying. Um, like, it, it, there, it's one of those big controversial moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Across F1, I would put that in the same like. Same tier. same tier, yeah. But if you want to think about like finishing a race based off countbacks, that would really kind of be like Australia from a couple years ago when they yeah, were restarting yeah, yeah, yeah. from that red flag where Nico Hulkenberg very well should have could have been in like podium contention, but they yeah. counted back. I, what was that? Was that 2023? It wasn't last season, was it? Was it, 20, it either 22 or 23? Google it. This, people. Is, this is a forward looking podcast. We don't do very well we looking back well unless the information is right in front of us. We're talking about history. Oh yeah. man! So, so we go from the, this this first incarnation of Tolman Motorsport, and then in '85, Benetton, which is a clothing company that had been the title sponsor of teams like Tyrell and Alfa Romeo, when we've talked about both of those teams before in other episodes, purchased Tolman and renamed it Benetton Formula for the '86 season, where one of the drivers who was more known than the other um, from that season is Gerhard Berger, who had a partial stake in ownership of. Toro Rosso for a hot minute. Tying and it, back. it all comes together. Everyone's so, everywhere. When we're looking at this, I mean, I know Benetton's name. I know the clothing brand, um, which I don't know if they're even around anymore. But um, I know that it was a Formula One team. I didn't put together that they were actually on the grid for a long time. So because yeah. they were a team like from they took over in 86 all the way into the 2000s. So into 2001, for me, it was like a flash in the pan, like maybe because they didn't have too much going on, like they weren't the most incredible team. Um, but yeah, for me, they were literally a team for five years and they were a team for like 15 yeah, they, they were a team that actually did pretty well. They finished in the top three of the dry standings in 50% of the seasons that it existed, eight of the 16, including six top three finishes. But they were all in the 90s, and we have no concept of what was happening. In for I was born. <laughs> you were also oh, okay. born. okay. I was also born. We weren't you old enough to actually look at F1. We we that. were not we we had no concept of F one at the time. I was busy watching Power Rangers. I don't know what you were watching in the early to mid nineties, but I was watching a lot of Power Rangers. You know, I don't know, and it's funny that we bring this up, and I'm going to go so off track, and I apologize. But my friend just had her thirtieth birthday, and it was nineties themed, and I realized that like everything I thought was nineties was actually early two thousands. So that's my <laughs> concept of time. <laughs> to, to continue that same vein of off track, the person who got me into Formula One is a late 90s child, and he 
mentioned, you know, doing an activity at camp one summer of like, you know, li life in the 90s. And I looked at him, I'm like, you were born in 1998. You didn't live in the 90s. You were a toddler in the 90s. Yeah. No, I was there. I was a 90s child. Someone was at the birthday, and I'm pretty sure she was born in like 88 or 89. And she like had no idea what was going on just because yeah. it was like so not her, not her vibe. But yeah. So fun fact, Emily thinks the 90s are actually the early 2000s, but. Time is weird. Anyway, to go back in time to 1986, that was uh, Benetton's first Formula One win at the Mexican Grand Prix, which was actually the Mexican Grand Prix uh, compared to what we have now, which is Mexico City Grand Prix. There's right. a difference in titles and branding. Um, but it was Benetton's 15th race and the 435th F1 race. Yeah, again, see, this is, like, so weird when teams start because you have Red Bull who started their first win was, like, number 900 of F1 Grand Prix or something, and so we're, like, jumping around. That's what also blows my mind. Time, um, so weird. And for some reason, I, like, I remember, maybe it's because it's Alpine and, and Renault, but I just, like, this whole team, I just remember as, and think of, like, not being good. But you are right. Like, they did finish high up in the standings for like half of their time but I don't know yeah, why it just and they like, they won the constructors title in 95 yeah with Michael see. Schumacher okay we have to talk about this and I know we'll get into this on another team but there are like a handful of drivers who I swear have driven on every single team yeah yep. Michael Schumacher being one of them that like Jules Verstappen being another one as well. Jules Verstappen. <laughs> well, we'll talk about him. Actually, we're, we we can talk about him now. Jules Verstappen. We've you talked about transition, Catherine. I, you know, I you did you tried really hard, and I really screwed that up. But and Jules Verstappen uh, just went right over my head. But Jules Verstappen, he was driving for Benetton when he had um, his car catch fire in the middle of the race, um, which is one of the few non-Max Verstappen things that Jos Verstappen is known for within Formula One, other than being on so many different teams over his, his long tenure of not really making it that far up the driver standings, but it was the 94 German Grand Prix um, refueling incident. Uh, fuel splattered onto the car, sparked. And what's interesting to me is not only did he DNF in the race, obviously, but only eight of the 26 drivers actually finished the race. And two of the eight drivers got lapped by the leader. Oh, what a yeah. race. And there were 11 retirements on the opening lap. Oh my god! What happened? Yeah. Uh, crash. Was it, all big, it was oh, just a big crash. Okay. Yeah, just, just a big crash. Well, Forgive big crash me for not knowing my crash. 1994 season statistics. <laughs> I mean, I I I looked up the results, and that's what it told me. But yeah, it was that was that was a lot. Um, and then other notable drivers, other than Jos Verstappen, is you know Nelson Piquet Senior and Martin Brundle, our favorite, who oh, also favorite. drove for a lot of teams. And then I also <laughs> wanted to. Oh, I just want to point something out. The familial ties of Jos and Nelson Piquet driving for the same team. Because if you don't know, Nelson Piquet, his daughter, Kelly, dates Jos's son, Max. Max. They're not quite in-laws because they're just dating. But circle gets a square. Family. Right. Exactly. Um, and then the other thing to point out that will be relevant shortly is of the team principals, we have the one and only Flavio Briatore, who actually did two stints at the team as a team principal at Benetton. He was there from 90 to 97. Um, so he was there for the 1995 um, constructors win and then also 2000 and 2001, where then we move into Renault part one, which is technically Renault part two, because... Okay. Renault had a stint as a constructor in the 70s and 80s. And now they no longer have a stint as a constructor. So. Well, they, yeah, they will be. They, they will no longer be an engine supplier, as has, has actually been announced officially. But that's for 2026. That is for 2026. Again, always looking towards the future. So, yeah, so for this part one-ish stint, we'll say, they took over the team and entered in the Australian Grand Prix in 2002. And they actually did have a win. So the next season at the Hungarian Grand Prix, which was the 30th race of this era, or like the actual 16th. Um, Renault which win. Which was actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and it was the 710th F1 race, and it was won by no other than our good old man friend, Fernando Alonso. Yep, and this is the era that Fernando won his driver's championships in 2005 and 2006. He was driving alongside Giancarlo Fisichella, and also 2005 was the season of the 2005 United States Grand Prix that I did a full episode about. Linked above. Yep. Um, Okay, I just need to stop for like a hot second because in my mind, Fernando Alonso did not win his world championships with Red Bull. <laughs> right? I, I just like completely blanked them out because I don't care about Alpine and I don't care about like this whole pyramid of teams. And like in my mind, Fernando Alonso won it with like unknown team A. <laughs> I, my mind always just thinks that he did it at Ferrari. And like, I have to right. remind myself that he did not win the championships at Ferrari. He, he did win them at Renault. And at the time, Flavio Briatore was a team principal all the way up until 2009. And tell me, Catherine, or tell us, if you will, what happened in 2009 and why did he leave? <laughs> well, technically... It's what happened in 2008, and it's okay. a little thing that we've talked about on the podcast before called Crashgate, where... Oh, uh, yes. How can we forget Crashgate? <laughs> well, if you have forgotten or you are new to Formula One and you are listening to this and you don't know what Crashgate is, Crashgate happened at the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix, which was at the first F1 night race. So it's like this big deal thing where Nelson Piquet Jr. was allegedly directed to crash deliberately to give Fernando Alonso, who had not qualified well, a, an advantage in, in the race. And among other things, it led to a lot of drama with Felipe Massa and his attempt at winning the 2008 World Championship, which ended up going to Lewis Hamilton. And we talked about what Massa has been trying to do legally to get them to give him the championship. It's, it's a whole thing that basically will probably never actually go into Massa's favor, because if anything, they're just going to invalidate the results of the entire 2008 Grand Prix, which right now, I think it's only that they've been retroactively disqualified. But the pettiest part about this for me is that Nelson Piquet Jr., aka Kelly's brother, son of Nelson Piquet Sr., etc., is he kind of got people aware that there was something to be aware of and that there was something sketchy about the the crash because he was told midway through the season he would not be retained for 2010 and he was butthurt about it. Yeah, but like at the same time, why, you're also implicating yourself because it might be a team order, but you don't have to do it. <laughs> Actively chose to do this. If this is true, it's all alleged, whatever. But like, you're also implicating yourself and showing like you would willingly crash. Like, it's not a good look for you. I don't know. No, I, I mean, I've, I've, is... well, that's why Nelson PK Jr. is no longer in Formula One at this point. But. Um, basically, the FIA investigated. Renault was charged with conspiracy. They did not contest the charges, which basically says, yeah, we know we screwed up. And Flavio Briatore and Pat Simons, um, who was also a member of the t- a senior member of the team, they were subsequently banned from the sport, which, as we know, did not last long at all because Simmons ter- returned to Formula One as the chief technical officer in 2017 and is now an executive consultant for Andretti Cadillac's attempt to come into F1. And and Briatore has come back a couple times, including this past season or this current season, where he is now a senior executive advisor, whatever, to Alpine for 2024. Right. And they also hit them with the uh, suspended sentence from yeah, they- F1. Yeah, basically um, they had two, two years. years where if they they would be immediately thrown out if they broke any rules again and were and were caught. But to I that end, they broke rules and were caught. <laughs> well, let's be real. Everyone breaks rules. They're not gonna um, self-report. It, who self report anything anyway? But they did end up leaving Formula One for a little bit because they sold a, a majority stake of Renault to a group called Genai Capital, which brought the Lotus brand back into Formula One. And now Lotus has actually been in Formula One a lot over yes. the years. And I just have to say, this era of Lotus is like a top 10 for me 
in all of F1 history, in all of things F1, these three years are my absolute favorite. Oh, this this is top tier. So Lotus's first era was um, was actually a really long time in Formula One. They were on the grid from 50, 1958 to 1994. And then they had a second era from 2010 to 2011 with a different team that was not this team because 2010 to 2011 was still Renault. But then they came on in 2012, bringing the brand back into the mix or in a sense, keeping it on the grid. Um with our one of our favorite drivers, Kimi Raikkonen. And Roman Grosjean. And Roman Grosjean, correct. So they were the, the drivers in their first entry in 2012. They had their first win in Abu Dhabi in that season. It was their 18th race of this current era and the 876th F1 race. But the most important thing that you need to know of this era of Lotus is that they were nearly bankrupted by Kimi Raikkonen. Yes. single-handedly okay and now we get to talk about emily's favorite thing with, which is contracts yes <laughs> full circle episode we've already aged fernando alonso we just need bishops to go off and then we hit the try 22 down. minutes <laughs> we'll get there don't worry um okay so kim reikinen had one of the most amazing contracts in f1 history i don't know the inflation what it would be like today but just the way that it was structured is insane. So his contract included a bonus of 50,000 euros for every World Driver Championship point he scored. Today, you don't really see contracts structured that way. And I know we've all heard about this contract and how it was almost bankrupt. But I just want to talk about the rarity of contracts written this way, especially for a driver like Kimmy. He ended up scoring 390 points over two years, and he only finished outside of the points in three races. So clearly they didn't really look at the, you know, risk of this very well, but his total Well, they didn't bonus, think that they were going to be good at all. Right, which is why they threw this in, in there. But I also don't understand how they ever would have gotten a contract signed with this bonus, which makes me think, like, they really had to go out and get him, make it attractive. And I bet he threw in like more for each point. Um, and they settled on 50. I guarantee that's what happened. But it was a hundred, it was 19.5 million euros just in bonus, not base salary. Yeah. So that's like if so you much. think about it in NFL terms, because I feel like that's the easiest way to translate this. Like, he had a guaranteed money, and then you also have the on top of that bonus. And it's not, like, an easy bonus for showing up to training camp or, like, getting one pass. Getting a point is hard in F1. So for him to get that much for every single point, score that many points, and get that big of a bonus, like, that's insane. Yeah, it's and he also insane. he also probably would have um, gotten more, but he missed the last two races of the season because he actually had to bow out that year because he needed back surgery. So that could that's two more races where he had you know a lot more grit, um, world championship points up for grabs that he could have added to the three hundred ninety points that he did accumulate over those two years. That's insane. I just yeah. this is like the craziest contract I think I've ever heard of and basically yeah, every team took one sports. look at that and said never again yeah because like yeah again like if you look think of any traditional sport pay for points like that's that would bankrupt people and it almost yeah. did I mean it literally almost did bankrupt Lotus but anyways yeah and I mean Lotus didn't last very long you know by the time yeah. they got to 2015 like and they were like their their best finish of this era of Lotus was P4 only P4 in 2012 and 2013 thanks to Raikkonen and a little bit of you know Grosjean and the other drivers you know driving with him which there were not a lot of drivers in this era you know Heike Kovalainen and Pastor Maldonado are two other you know drivers of note of a you know very short-lived tenure before Renault said hey we want to buy our team back and then they came back on in 2016. Yes so they returned for a shorter stint four years how long was their last stint yeah 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 because their other stint was longer yeah five five years. years I will never get seasons in math right. We just math is so hard. Math is the hardest. 
So this is when we have good old K Mags. Let's talk about him. So him and Jolan Palmer. Jolian. Jolian Palmer. I also will never say names correctly. They raced in the first second coming of Renault race in 2016 at the Australian Grand Prix. Yeah. And then their best season of that era was only P4. But if you think about it, like that's where Renault kind of should be, where they're, you know, very much not at this point at Renault Alpine, but they were P4 in 2018 with two of our, you know, most liked drivers, Nico Hulkenberg and Carlos Sainz, which like thinking about like getting closer and closer to like, here are like the drivers that we know and that we have concept concept of like, that's just very interesting to me. And this is also the, the beginning of the decline of, you know, Renault as a constructor. This is that era where Red Bull and Renault were fighting because Renault or Red Bull was a Renault customer at this time. And you see right. the, 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 the first season of Drive to Survive is Red Bull's team principal, Christian Horner, and uh, Renault's team principal, Cyril, whose name I, last name I will not try to pronounce, like that's when they were fighting in 2017. I would also like to make known and give my opinion that this is where Daniel Ricardo's career went to die. Oh, of course. I yeah. think he also has, has admitted that on the podcast as well. But another driver that drove for them is Esty Bestie, who currently drives for Alpine. So he followed in that wave and the Renault team rebranded to Alpine in 2021. And it's the team that we know and forget about today. Um, So, so they, um, which, and this is another thing that I forget, but I don't know how I can forget is that Fernando Alonso drove with SC in 2021. And that's when they had their first entry, but it's like he left and he came back. I just, I never put together that Fernando Alonso had anything to do with this team. And I don't know why, because he did it twice. (laughs) Well, yeah, but here's the thing, Fernando in, you know, he, he left after 2022, which caused silly season. I know. know. With Oscar Piastri. Yeah. I know. Well, no, 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 no. That's not fair. You're giving it too much credit. Seb caused silly season. Yes. Seb was the first domino to fall. Domino because he left. Fernando Alonso was the second. Yeah, and yes. then we and then we have you know the the 2022 silly season of all time. But other thing that I want to point out is Alpine and also Renault. They this the entire era once we get to Renault, the the first Renault is there as I wouldn't say as hard as Ferrari on their team principles, but they are a team that goes through team principles more towards how Ferrari does compared to other teams when you have like two instances of Flavio Briatore, Cyril who got, you know, unceremoniously dumped, et cetera. Otmar Safnauer who got fired at Spa, Bruno Famine who got fired at Spa a year later, current team principal Oliver Oaks who will probably also get fired at Spa next year. So I just want to know like what's up with Spa. Like, yeah. If you're, if you are a team principal of Alpine at any point in your life, just avoid spa. Just like, don't go. Go to a spa. Don't go to spa. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Don't do that. You'll probably get fired. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But that, that is, that is Alpine. Like that, or that, yeah, that, that is Alpine, you know, from, from Tolman to, to where we are today, they had a lot happen. They did. And I don't, I think. I think we owe it to SD Bestie to also mention that he did win a race with the second yes, coming that is true. of, um, or not the second coming with the Alpine rebrand, which I always forget that he has won a race. Um, yes. I just, again, this team is so incredibly forgettable to me. Yeah, it so. really is. But yeah, he did win that race in 2021 in Hungary. Hungary is also like a a good race for first teams wins. You know, between Hungary and China, mm-hmm. I feel like we've been mentioning that yeah, a lot. Yeah, we on this talked show, about those so in the series. Um, yeah, yeah and it was that. the it was the 1046 F1 race, and I didn't put how many races this was for Alpine, um, but it was not that many because it was the it was 2021, which was their first season. But if you want to think about it, they're still also technically run out still. So if you want to do the math, because Catherine didn't. 
go for it. You <laughs> can go, go to statsf1.com and you will it, it will Don't spoon give away feed our it secrets, for you. Catherine. It's it's not <laughs> statsf1.com is one hell of a resource. Highly recommend if you are curious about when things happen and what happened and all the records that they spout out on broadcast. Statsf1 is one of the the go-to locations. There you go. Heard secret secrets. Yes. From the horse's mouth. Um, okay. So that's Alpine. And I just like want to recognize, yes, they had a lot that has gone on, but I also don't really care. And I do really want to just get into the finale of this series that we have all been waiting for. Yeah. I know you guys have all been waiting for this. We have been dying for this. It's Aston Martin. Yeah. And speaking of things that we don't really care about, we do. There's a few iterations of this team that are pretty forgettable yeah we, we can go with that their first one is actually pretty relevant jordan grand prix is you know they 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 did some things in there we have there are some things of note Catherine but and then i have a different definition of relevant <laughs> no but i but if you want to talk about irrelevant that's going to be these seasons of midland and spiker which we'll talk about before we get into the one thing that we actually want to talk about which is force india but there are some things that are notable for the era that was jordan grand prix from 1991 to 2005 first of all eddie jordan who we all know you know he he's one of the names around Formula One didn't do, you know, he didn't make it to Formula One, but he did some racing in the eighties and turned and, you know, one of his teams into an organization that did well in the lower series before turning it into Jordan Grand Prix for Formula One in 1991, where I was a year old. There you go. Yes. Yeah. And so in 1991, they entered their first Grand Prix, which was at the United States Grand Prix, actually. Yeah. Which was fun. Yeah, their their driver situation that year was interesting because they had one driver who did the entire season. And then they had four drivers in that second seat, starting with Bertrand Gachot, who drove races one through 10 and then had to leave Formula One because he went to prison for attacking a taxi driver. And he was replaced by this young upstart driver who was actually on loan from Mercedes named Michael Schumacher, who eventually did kind of okay with, for, with himself for Formula One. But he, the, he um, Mercedes did pay Jordan to have Schumacher race in that race that he competed in that year. But he only raced in one. Yeah, one race, and then he went. It was it was kind of like the what, the situation where like when Lewis Hamilton missed one of the races in 2020 because he got COVID, and they called up George Russell from Williams to drive for him. That's yeah. basically what the situation was, except in this case back then, Mercedes actually paid Jordan for the opportunity. Interesting. Which you know, he was I a paid driver to start, and then became fair. really good. That's fair. I, um, you know, I don't know if there's many instances in racing where someone just misses half the season because they're in prison. <laughs> well, I mean, it was, it was more like he just got very unceremoniously fired and was like, um, we're, we're, we're not going to deal with that anymore. Um, and then they kind of fill, you know, backfilled in to cover out the rest of the season for um, De Caceres to have someone partner with him. And it was kind of a surprise every week. And this was, of course, when there were only 16 races in a season. You get a race. You get a you race. Get a you get a you race. Get a race. Every Thanks. driver gets a race. Thanks, Oprah. But it uh, also, like back back then, like it it really was a lot more common for teams to have you know three, four, even like eight hundred drivers back in the like fifties and sixties. Like anything went when it came to like you know who was driving for what. But it, even you know getting into the nineties, some teams did have a lot more drivers than you know. Like for us, the the situation at Alpha Tauri with Nick DeVries, Danny Ricardo, Liam Lawson, like for us, that's kind of weird because we're, you know, we're relatively new to Formula One in the grand scheme of this sport, but really not as uncommon if you look back, it's just in the, this kind of era where the way the rules are structured and things like that, that you have where it's a lot easier for it just to be two drivers in two seats for the entire season barring yeah. you know little little things like appendix <laughs> removals I was just gonna say 
say appendicitis. <laughs> like appendicitis. Uh, like yeah. appendicitis. Um, okay, so going back to Jordan Grand Prix. So they did get a win, which I guess is, you know, semi-relevant. Um, ish. But it took them a while. It was their 127th race, which was at the 1998 Belgian Grand Prix. And it was the 627th F1 race. Yeah. And then 99 was their best season, you know, in in their tenure, um, finishing P3 with two wins and six total uh, podiums between their two drivers. But they also, like, if you looked at the, the drivers of note, they have drivers who are, like, names in formula one rubens barrichello giancarlo fisichella rubens barrichello everywhere literally raced for every single team we've talked about yeah same with fisichella fisichella has been everywhere jean alacy yarno truly my least favorite ralph schumacher eddie irvine takuma sato martin brundle and then highlight is tiago montero who was the guy who had a great time at the 2005 united states grand prix because it was his first and only podium of his career even if it was a six-man race he only had to be better than 50 percent of the grid to, to be on the podium and he was and you know he finished behind two ferraris and he finished way behind the two ferraris if you look at like the, the timings, but it was Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello were the other two drivers on in that race. And if you watch our episode, you'll, uh, you'll talk, you'll, I'll, I'll talk about the controversy involved, but we don't have to get back into it since we have so many other things to go through. Well, I'm going to just maybe breeze past these next two. We can do like a fun fact, but for two years, this team changed hands. So in 2006, it was Midland F1 racing in 2007, it was Spiker F1 team. And then we get into the juicy stuff. So, Catherine, I'm going to give you one fun fact for Midland and one fun fact for Spiker because we're trying to keep this under two hours, which we're actually doing a really good job, I would just like to point out. I would, um, I would also agree. So, <laughs> But yeah, so hit me with a fun fact for each one of these two, and then we can get into the meat and potatoes of this episode. So yeah, so Midland, they did nothing that year. The only thing that's like, <laughs> like, <on>. <laughs> like literally, they're not, they were not good. Their best finish was p9 as a driver um and that was tiago montero but he didn't even score points because they only scored down to p8 at the at the time but what is an actual fun fact is their team principal colin coles who started as team principal back in in the at the end of the jordan era is known for two things one he had some skills in dentistry and montero had a toothache that was potentially severe enough to keep him out of the the race that he was going into so Coles had to perform dental surgery on Montero to get him into the race. And then the other fun fact Hold about on. this guy. Can we just pause? I think yes. we're skipping over the dentistry too quickly, honestly. Because there's no information about dentistry <laughs> other than the fact that he had the skill. Has skills in dentistry. Why and what skills? I, <laughs> that is what I want to know. <laughs> I don't know because everywhere that I looked did not have a lot of information about it other than the fact that he has some skills in dentistry. He's Romanian and that that's really all we like, know that's there. To make it better. <laughs> I don't know. I'm oh, giving yes, you the if you're Romanian, you have dentistry skills. <laughs> well, you know what? That's all I know about this guy. But yeah, oh. he had to perform dental surgery on his driver going into the race. And th this guy actually stayed on as team principal through Spiker and into Force India before he was pushed out. But the other bit Wait, of it. I still have yes. one more thing. <laughs> what? <laughs> now I'm really stuck on this dentistry thing. We're going to spend like an hour on Midland because I don't understand. Okay, can you, but like, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. This is literally like Zach Brown being like, oh, Lando, you got to <laughs> Don't worry. I got some skills and I got pliers. Like, we got this. Like, I just go see a real dentist. Why okay, you... okay. So he is a real dentist. That's the family business. And then he joined motor racing. So all Romanians are dentists. This is what we're getting at. There you go. <laughs> well, no, but that, apparently, the, according to his Wikipedia article, so take this with a grain of salt, that is his family business. And then he entered racing in the 2000s and made his way into Formula One eventually. 
wow, that's almost more impressive because he entered in the two, like, this was his first gig and he just became team principal after being a dentist. Like, no, no, no. He had he had some some gigs in between, um, going from Jordan to in between his dentistry, in between appointments. Started no before <laughs> between dentistry and Formula One. There was some stuff in the lower series. No, I'm just imagining you like gotta fill this cavity really quick. I gotta hit the racetrack. You gotta grow and breathe. Oh my god. Okay, this guy has just made my night. Okay, I mean, I'm, but he also I'm finally proves found a side. I'm, he he I proves that if you want to skills are from dentist to F1, to F1 grant team renewal. I'm pretty sure there's none, but I think it really means that if you want to have like a radical tr- career change midway through your life, you're like it's it's something that you can do for yourself. Hold my beer. I'm going to transition from auditor to team principal. <laughs> okay, I'm satisfied with our conversation about the dentistry. We can okay, move on to point there's, two. That is there's fun fact one. More, <laughs> there's one more point about this guy, and that point is that he tried to, he allegedly, allegedly tried to blackmail Toto Wolf, team principal at Mercedes, because he had allegedly recorded Wolf making negative remarks about Mercedes team management. I liked it better when we were talking about the dentistry <laughs> skills. Yeah, but I'm like, so this guy goes from dentist to alleged blackmailer to also team principal for many years in Formula One, which is like not like nothing to sneeze at, even if the teams weren't great. I mean, he's lived a million lives. Yes, Look at him go. He really has, and in I those if he million went back lives, to his dentistry practice. Who knows? I sure don't. But he so Midland. There was there was some dramatic background with the ownership in Midland that I really did not have time to look into. But basically, Midland very quickly sold from to Spiker Cars, which became Spiker F1 team in 2007, which they technically joined the grid in 2006 in that Midland season as the title sponsor because you can't got it, got it, got it. change the team name mid-season. Mid-season, yeah. Yeah, so, they, so basically he did sell mid-season and they kept Midland on for the last few races, but it was like Striker Midland and then became um, Striker in – uh, words, Catherine, in 2007, they averaged one single point, which was scored at the Japanese Grand Prix uh, by finishing P8. And then we move on to Force India, which is the only team that we ever actually want to talk about. Oh, Force India, 10 years of madness. Okay. Yeah. So in 2008, this spiker team was sold to my man. VJ Malia for 88 uh, million. There we go. Vision's dinner. Jack. We're done. Yeah. Um, bingo. <laughs> <laughs> um, was sold to VJ Malia. And if you don't, Malia, I will, I can't pronounce anything. Please. I'm begging for forgiveness. But if you don't know who this man is, I highly suggest you look at his Wikipedia page and also watch the... Force India episode on Drive to Survive because we will never be able to narrate this entire thing as well as they do. Um, yeah. But this is the kind of crazy thing I want to point out and highlight is that this team sold for 88 million euros. I, I understand it's in 2007, but that seems like no money at all for an F1 team. Well, it, it wasn't, but also if you think about it, like Formula One really shot up in A, popularity, and B, in value when it was purchased by Liberty Media in 2017. And that, like like you said in, in the last episode, coming on, you know, a new, you know, new team being bought, you know, new influx of money should mean that you get this like radical jump in performance. And that was one of the things that you noticed for Red Bull that like didn't really happen until Red Bull came on the grid and like the other teams before Red Bull that led to them didn't really have a lot of success, even as, as right. they changed hands. When Formula One changed hands and was purchased by Liberty Media, they shot up in relevance and in value. That's fair. Drive to Survive started in what 20 it the first season of drive to survive was what 2017 um so it was either 17 or 18 so it that really was one of those 
you know, major jumps where then all of a sudden all of the team's value valuations have shot up ras- drastically. Yeah, no, that's fair. But still, I think it's like still way too low. <laughs> I will not change oh, my opinion. I, agree. I understand what you're saying, but it's, yeah, but it's I mean, too low. What was uh, 8 million euros in, what is it? In 2008, worth we're, we're going to do 2008. Um, okay, here we go. Um, 88. Pause for math. Pause for math. <laughs> um, this 88 million dollars or 88 million euros in 2008 is worth 122.8 million euros today. Still too low. Still too low, but also really goes, but also the, you know, Formula One relevance was, was not at that time. Yes. But. Agreed. Also agreed. But also really interesting thing about Force India before we get to like the most interesting part about Force India is this team never won a race. Classic. <laughs> yeah. They, they finished P2 in, at, in 2009 at the Belgian Grand Prix, Giancarlo Fisichella, who literally, I feel like, has been who dr- drove for 50 years. Uh, but their best seasons constructors-wise were P4 in 16 and 17. And then 16, the drivers were Sergio Perez and Nico Hulkenberg. And then 2017, Sergio Perez and Esti Besti. Hmm. Checo. Yep. But also... You could make the claim that Checo is responsible is partially responsible for Aston Martin coming to existence. Yes, I I can't argue that point. I really cannot. So let's get into how Sergio Perez is relevant here. So again, hopefully you've paused our episode and you've run to your TV and watched the Netflix episode on Force India. But if you haven't, we can kind of give you the highlights. So the owner, Malia was kind of tied up in a huge financial scandal and and controversies and it wasn't just like all of a sudden this had been building um for years well yeah years and years and years he left india to be closer to his children in 2016 allegedly allegedly um and essentially he couldn't go back to india because he was in so much trouble there um yeah. Right, so one of the yeah one of the so basically he owed about in in United States money about one point one billion dollars in loans US to dollars. <laughs> yeah it um to about seventeen different Indian banks and he basically said I'm leaving to to go to the to the United Kingdom where his team is based out of to be closer to my children but also because the Indian authorities were like closing in on him and and also like tried to stop him from leaving the country but by the time they all you know got their act together he had already been gone um and yeah. was connected to a pretty significant money laundering probe that ended up with basically all of his assets being frozen which is one thing when you're shenaniganing around the world being Mr. Big Spender and is another thing when you can't pay the salaries of your employees. Yeah. So with that being said, clearly the team was in trouble. So in 2018, they went into administration, which is basically bankruptcy. And this happened like mid season. This is a, you know, the winter, this was in the middle of the season. Um, I think it was after like the 11th race, 12th race it was, of the season. It was, it was during Hungary, which was the 12th race. And this was instigated by its creditors, the team's creditors, which included Sergio Perez, which, you know, obviously with Perez and, and all the sponsorship that he brings to a team, he was able to kind of look around and say, this is going to be a problem. And had he and the other creditors really not stepped in, the team would have collapsed and everyone would have lost their jobs and this team would not have existed. Right. And so what happened was they were pretty much being propped up by these creditors until they could find new ownership for the team. So the team just wouldn't like disband. So they, including Serge and why do they call him Serge? Mm -hmm. Um, Checo Checo. um, and all of his, you know, Mexico um, telecommunication sponsors were kind of like propping up the team until they could figure out how to sell the team, what to do with the team. And this is when, you know, Daddy Stroll comes into the picture as well. 
Yeah, but can we also talk about the fact that so so basically when for so for Force India that year was Sahara Force India and right. then became Racing Point Force India for the rest of the team after you know race 13 on but because of the way it changed hands it had to be considered a brand new separate team so the original races 1 through 12 all of those points everything ended at Sahara Force India and then right. Racing Point Force India for the last bit of the season they actually still managed to finish P7 in the championship with only 9 races under their belt which yes sounds impressive but I also want to point out that generally, not always, but generally, 8, 9, and 10 have like 5 points. So if they race and they got P7 in one race, they're probably already in P8. You're not wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah, but considering the, you know, the instability, it very well could have gone another way. Like, And they also, like, definitely could not pay for a lot of their salaries until the consortium came in. And the consortium was Daddy Stroll, you know, led. And that's what, you know, got them to, you know, get through to the end of the season. Then we move on to Racing Point. And also, you know, VJ Malia was arrested and charged and um there might have like probably was like a you know he was probably you know sentenced to jail and then probably never went but I think he was on house arrest for a while he definitely was restricted to the UK like he could not travel because he, he didn't have leave. a passport yeah he could yeah. not leave the United Kingdom so like the only race that he appeared at in 2018 uh, was I'm Silverstone so right in his backyard because the Indian authorities wanted him repatriated and you know I'm not sure what extradition rules are with the UK and India but he I, I'm pretty sure he had I, I don't think he he was very easily or very quickly ending up back in India no and before we get on to racing points few seasons I do want to just take back what I said earlier in the episode of I don't know how many people have left F1 midway through the season because they go to jail. <laughs> did I know who we talking? <laughs> well, no, actually, I didn't know, but I just, like, it didn't register that we'd also be talking about BJ. So, um, yeah, I take that back because... Look what happened. <laughs> well, I, I, he he definitely did, he didn't go straight to jail from you know unloading okay. the leaving but, halfway through for illegal activity. Let's yes, put it that that that, way. that has has been a thing. But you know it's oh where was I going with this? But but yeah this this was probably one of the biggest controversies and you know right up there with with Crashgate. Right. This was this was not a cheating scandal in the way that Crashgate was though they're actually kind of. I'll get there in a second. Uh, there was a little bit of, of cheating involved coming up next, but it's like, it's, it has to be really significant for formula one to come in and say, we're taking over your team because you are mismanaging it to the point that it's about to implode on itself. And like, that's not something that you see, you know, happen very often in sports, especially sports at this level. Correct. Yeah. Wild. Okay. So, halfway through 2018, Daddy Stroll steps in. Saves the day. Becomes, saves the day like the hero he is. And they become Racing Point Force India. 2019, they become just Racing Point. Still owned by Daddy Stroll. To no surprise, the drivers for that season were Sergio Perez, who helped save the team, and Lance Stroll, for obvious reasons. Yeah, so, and, but this did kind of screw over Esteban Ocon, because it did. there was really no, like, if you look at driver performance, there was really no reason to get rid of Esteban Ocon. His contract, I do believe, was up, or I'm sure there was something, you know, related to, you know, the contract's terms changing due to the administration but 
if Lance Stroll is, or if Lawrence Stroll is buying a team, he's buying it so his kid can race. So Lance Stroll came on to Racing Point and Esteban Ocon was off the grid for a year. I think he was a reserve driver for Mercedes that season before he came back yeah. on. And Alpine brought, you know, Renault Alpine brought him back and kind of saved his ability to stay on the Formula One grid until he got so mad at Pierre Gasly this year at Monaco that they said, you're fired and now you have to drive for Haas in 2025. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> and that's Esteban Ocon. And that's Esteban Ocon. Um, so this team did win a race. So in 2020, Sergio Perez won in uh, the Su- Secure. Secure Grand Prix. What race was that? Um, this was in 2020 when a couple of the tracks that have, you know, the option of having multiple configurations. Oh, so this was yes, technically yes. in Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi. Okay, but it right, was the right. alternate version, track. which they, which they've done this track, you know, they've raced the Sakir track before, but this was the kind of the first time that they had to, you know, do one, you know, one week they're going one direction and the other week they're going another direction in the t- t- typical Abu Dhabi race. Right. Thank you for clarifying. My brain is not in my head. But this was the 37th racing point race and the 1,034. 1,034th F1 race. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, and then this uh, this bit is really interesting for for me, is, and I don't think that they really covered any of this in Drive to Survive. Is they finished P four in twenty twenty with one hundred and ninety five points, but the team actually scored two hundred and ten points. And I, I could be wrong. This could have been brought up in Drive to Survive. It's just been a, a while since I've I've watched the, this season, but they had 210 points which would have been enough for p3 but Renault protested the legality of their car so they lost 15 points which moved them down to p4 am i wrong did did, did i forget this uh no i think that's right well no but i mean did did i did i forget watching it on drive to survive oh like did they talk remember this i don't remember them yeah no i don't think i don't remember it being covered Okay, so I'm not crazy. But I also, or... like, don't... It's been a really, really long time since I've watched it. I just... The big thing on, for um, like, this whole thing was just, like, the changing of the team and... Right, right, exactly. And stroll and everything. Like, and I remember... You know, wait, wait, wait. Paris was, this, race. was this the pink Mercedes drama? it might it may have been yeah so basically there was okay yeah 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 yeah. if 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 i'm right i might be wrong this was related to what they were calling the pink mercedes where aston martin came out with basically a knockoff of the mercedes car and that was their car and everyone was mad especially mercedes which aston martin would eventually come out with the green red bull and you know red bull trolled them by drinking green red bulls on their pit wall but anyway that's probably what that was related to. And if yeah. I'm wrong and you have watched that season of Drive to Survive more recently than we have, let us know in the comments. Yes, let us know. Okay, so that ushers in the current team Era. that we know and love, uh, which is Aston Martin F1 team. So in 20, end of 2020, I think. Yeah, something like um, that. Yeah, end of 2020. Daddy Stroll, I love how we just refer to him as Daddy Stroll. Yeah. Um, Daddy Stroll bought a 16.7% stake in Aston Martin, which rebranded the team from Racing Point to Aston Martin. So that's why that transition happened, if you missed that. But this happened in for the 2021 season, so they have been Aston Martin since then. Yep. Um, they, and this is something I also, I don't forget, but I'm just really impressed with what daddy stroll has done pulling in drivers like we always we know that one seat will always be lance's but like getting seb Vettel even at the end of his career is still a really good get and then he brings in fernando who's also maybe towards the end of his career but a really good get so it's just really impressive again contracts speak here but they must really have good contracts if they're able to Go to a team who's not, like, number one. And it, I mean, I guess it's a good place to write out the end of your career. But it's just impressive. And it's something yeah. that I thought a lot about. 
Yeah, I mean, if you look at like Ferrari is where team, you know, careers go to drop. Words, Catherine. Ferrari is where you know careers go to die. Aston Martin is where careers go to gently ride off into the sunset. But also, if you look, like, yes, Fernando is towards like the tail end of his career, probably. But you know, look at the twenty twenty three season. They finished P five, propelled primarily by Fernando's performance with eight podiums. Yeah, I think he just needs a better car, honestly. And I think next year they'll have one. So, and even the next one, or the next year. Yeah. So, I think, honestly, I don't know. We've made bold predictions before, but I think Aston Martin could really... Come I would love to see Aston Martin as a contender. I mean, I they have Adrian Newey coming. to not be on the team. That is my, that's my grief. My yeah, grief I mean, team. we've talked about this before, that the best thing that Aston Martin will ever be able to do for themselves is move on from Lance Stroll and basically just hire Yuki Tsunoda instead. But... Like, and I mean, if you look so far, I, I've, I've talked before that Lance Stroll has never once beat his teammate in the driver's championship. And Fernando did all of the heavy lifting in 2023. Fernando and Sebastian Vettel have all of Aston Martin's career podiums. One of them is Vettel's and the rest of them are, are Fernando's. And Lance is just kind of there as a person who exists on the team. See, and... We, I think we we view this differently, but not intentionally. Like, I think of Lance Stroll, and I think, well, his dad got him his seat. He's not the worst on the grid. He does score points. So, it's not the worst. But, at the same time, like, it could be so much better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's good enough to be on the grid. He's good, he, you know, but he, if if his father was not involved in Formula One to the extent that Lawrence Stroll is, Lance Stroll would not still be on the team. 100%. If this was any other driver, they would have been gone. Exactly. Your neighbors are having a really good time right now. Who knows? Honestly, don't ever live in an apartment complex with me. People. Other other people, yeah. So Anyone. it'll be, it'll be interesting, but I I do think that there's an opportunity for Aston Martin to you know they're not having a great year this year. Like they they've even said at some point that like P eight P nine is really what they can hope for right now in like race race wise finishing. But I think that there's there's a lot more mileage to come with Aston Martin, and I think that Fernando Alonso will stick with it as long as you know as long as he wants to, they'll let him. The best is yet to come for Aston Martin. And the young rookie, Fernando Alonso. Ah, old man Alonso. Well, Catherine, I don't think I can keep you talking for 24 more minutes so that we go over 34 more minutes, however many more minutes that would get us over an hour and a half. So you get the under. Um, That, I I enjoyed this episode a lot. I did So much to talk about. But also super, super interesting. Again, this is part five of five. <laughs> um, we do have four other parts. I highly encourage you to go and look at those, watch them, listen to them, enjoy them. Um, I, I, I found this whole thing really interesting. And I do just want to give a shout out to Catherine for doing all of this research. Thank you. I have no time to do it. But we still wanted to get this episode out there. So if you need stats, go to Catherine. Yeah. And <laughs> or any research done. <laughs> I mean, this I I I I do I do do decent research. But this this whole thing was was fascinating because obviously as we are relatively new to the grand scheme of Formula One, it is nice to have a one-stop shop for us to kind of see how these teams have come to exist and also to see like how there are some drivers that may not feel like they have very relevant careers, but they've been freaking everywhere. And to just kind of see how that evolution has gone and like looking at drivers who have driven for like 800 years, it feels like if you're, you know, Giancarlo Vizicala, like it's, it's been so interesting to, to go through all of this. And I had fun. I know Emily, you had fun with this. I hope you listening also had fun with this as we wait out the F1 fall break, which is coming to its end this weekend. Thank goodness. We can get back to our, our usual racing discussions and our, also our, our usual um, posting schedules. (laughs) Yes, we will be back. This has been such a weird time for F1. It's like another break, but 
Here for and then it. we're having another another break in you know um, after Brazil, but we will not be doing a series like this after Brazil because our brains hurt and we are very busy. And by we, I do mean Emily because Emily's a lot busier than I am. <laughs> Oh, it's funny how you move back to the U.S. and you have a real job again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, thank you guys for joining us for this fun series. We'll have to come up with another fun series of maybe not five parts, but a series nonetheless within our, our F101 segments. Um, but yeah, this is our fifth and final F101 F1 Team Genealogy episode. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for going off track of this, guys.